We're back with a fun one today. Yay! Probably the wrong, that's probably setting the wrong tone for today. <clears throat> We're back with a fun one today! I had a gentleman called Stephen Winters on. And he is, well, currently, he owns the beautifully crafted Tom Winters Barbers on the end of North Main Street. You may have seen it, you may not. You should check it out. If you're someone who likes a good haircut, male or female, they don't discriminate. You need to go down to Tom Winters Barbers on North Main Street. If you're someone who just likes to see cool places, you need to go to Tom Winter Barbers on North Main Street. If you need to go to the Gate Cinema, you should go to Tom Winter Barbers on North Main Street. Because the cinema's beside it. Tom Winter's Barbers, it's where it's at. It's also where Stephen works. Not just works, owns it. Stephen, originally from Dublin, moved to Cork, decided, I don't wanna hang around here forever. I'm out. Disappeared. Australia did a crazy few jobs over there before signing up with the Australian military he trained there his first tour was in Afghanistan came back and I believe then he returned to Afghanistan but he wasn't just following orders he was built for the life that comes from being in the military he was built for the chaos and the incredible pressure they get left on the shoulders of men and women who go to war in these foreign countries. And because he was built for it, he excelled at it. He did extremely well. And he was on multiple special units set up for very high level tasks. And he's traveled the world with the military, North Africa, all across the Middle East, parts of Europe. He's met all these fascinating and interesting people. But he lived to tell the tale and he's sane. He's come out of it, I won't say unscathed, but in the course of the podcast, I draw comparisons between Stephen and another fellow I know who was in the Israeli Special Forces, and that man's a wreck. And by drawing him across Stephen, you see the two consequences that can come about from people who go through the military. But super cool dude, super chill, great to talk to. He's got this fashion and dress game down to a T. It's like Beauty and the Beast in this podcast. And I'll probably pick his brain at a later date around fashion and dress and hair. But for now, I have a solid podcast ready to go. As always, I'll ask you to please like, subscribe, and share the channel. Talk about it with your friends. Post it on your Insta stories. You're beginning to see a nice little collection of ramble clips building up. Share those clips. Because they're nice little summaries that might draw people in. I rely on your interaction to grow. So please give me your likes. So Ramble Land episode... Damn, I need to start recording these properly. Episode 12. Ramble on episode 12 with Stephen Winters. And we're live. We're well, live? Well, not live, live, <laughs> but we're, anything we say now can be used against us in evidence in the court of law. Oh, I see. I don't know actually. Right. I do wonder Maybe actually, could I ever get in legal trouble? Because technically it is a conversation. Yeah. And you're you're allowed to say a lot of things in a conversation. Mm. But because I'm publishing it, could I get in trouble? If I said something criminal. Fuck, you should have asked Dara. I should have asked Dara. You should have. I should have asked Dara. That was, that was <laughs> Stephen, welcome, How are you? welcome to Ramble Land. How are you, sir? I'm great. Pleasure to be here. Ah oh, man, thank you, thank you for making the time to, to come out to me. No problem. Um, so just briefly introduce yourself and what you do around Cork. What I do around Cork. What you do around Cork. I'm Stephen. I am. I'm an Irish man. I'm not a Cork man. I'm not a Dublin man. I'm not. Even though I was born in Dublin, raised in Meath, but I was brought up. In Cork, like you still have the twang of Dublin, right? I still have the twang of all sorts, proper <laughs> mongrel accent. But I'm an Irish man, I'm an ex soldier, I'm now a barber in Cork, and I love it. 
and I just have a thirst for life and putting myself in uncomfortable. I like that. Yes. Yeah. Nice. No, that's a good. Sign. That's a good introduction. There we go. That was that was good. <laughs> I didn't know you were raised in Cork. Hmm. Um, my family would have moved down here when I was around seven. Okay. Seven or eight, I think it was. For work. Yeah. yeah and a whole different change of life. Yeah. Okay. Mm. There was um, like you would you would have just come down with your family and do, did you already have family in Cork or anything? No, no, no family no, whatsoever. Everyone's up in either Dublin. Mead or Dublin. Yeah. And would you still be in contact with all them? Yeah. Uh, oh, the, the family's a tight knit family. Me being in contact with them mm. as an individual, not so much. Like, mm. but if something's on, I'll. I yeah. show face. You show like, face, yeah, of course, like. yeah. And a lovely face you have to show. Oh, thank you. You're looking <laughs> dapper as always. Because one of the things, if particular people from Cork who maybe listen to this, they'll recognise. They well, if they're if they're not already going to Tom Winters Barbers, which is at the end of North Main Street, mm-hmm. which is an outstanding shop, by the way. Mm-hmm. You've taken the thank whole you. the gentleman's image, and you you've brought it into the the modern times, and it's it. it's a yeah. savage shop you have in there, man. Um, and so people, if if they don't go to that, may recognise you from going around town, always well dressed. And that's how I didn't actually realise. I knew who owned Tom Winters, but yeah, I did because yeah. when you be walking, when you be walking past me and working when I'm working nights, you you always struck me as this well dressed man. You used to come up to me late at night and try to get in. I always <laughs> let you in as well, like because you're never <laughs> any trouble. But you were never never short of the the oof, perfect dress. Thank you. Dress yeah. is important for you. Is it? it is, yeah, most certainly. How come? It's how you feel, but what you put on, like you know, it's all to do with how I feel, and my dress and how I how I dress for work. It's another. It's like an. It's a, like another aura of confidence and a kind of like a layer of armor around me, as well, like. And so, like, were you always into dressing well? I always wanted to. Mm. I always wanted to. But maybe there was a time where you didn't have the means to. I Oh, most of my life, yeah, yeah I didn't have the means to. And, and then so, when I was in the military, I'm in one uniform and everyone looks the same. And did you, th- did that, how did that affect you? It didn't really affect me too much. However, whenever I would look at, let's say, the civilian aspect, I, I'm looking... From the inside back out at mm. the civilian world i could be looking at i'd look at men and see how they dress and how they carry themselves and how they were conforming to particular groups mm-hmm. or they were standing out as an individual like do you know and i was like whenever i do eventually hang out hang up my headdress or whatever it may be and put away my stable belt um, and my flashes, I'm gonna dress well. Nice. Yeah. And then when the opportunity came, that's exactly what you that did. That was it, exactly, yeah. I like that. Because mm. it says a lot about someone in the way they, they choose to present themselves. Yeah, um, I think so. Like, because it, it is, at the end of the day, there's, it's, it's the, one of the first things people notice about you is how you're dressed. Mm. And it is, whether it's a conscious decision in the morning or not, what you choose to put on is a reflection of where you are mentally. Yeah. And you do put, you can manipulate that to portray a certain image. I remember I was going, I'm going through um, Curtis Jackson's audio book at the minute, so that's 50 Cent, yeah. released the second book, where he's trying to change the persona of who he is. And now we, the book is yes. about Curtis Jackson rather mm-hmm. than 50 Cent, because he had Get Richard Die Trying, and now he's trying to reinvent himself. Well, not trying to, he has. Um, and one of the things he always remarked on was how his person was dressed. Yeah. Now he believes in always dressing well, mm-hmm. and that that's it's intrinsic to to having success is dressing well, and you can you can achieve a lot more by putting focus into how you're dressed and how you how you present yourself, and you may get a lot more depending. And there's, to a certain degree, I, I would agree with that. But for me, comfort has always been key. Yes. So I'm always going to wear comfortable clothes, mm-hmm. but I try and stay away from generic looks at the same time, yes. which is a hard line to walk it is. because a lot of comfortable clothes are what's now fashionable in terms of tracksuits and, and yeah. all these expensive designer label, soft material, mm-hmm. fabric tracksuits that people are wearing. And so I try and, st- 
I don't know. I don't know how I do it. I try and mix and match with clothes that probably shouldn't be worn if you're going out in public, <laughs> and I just slap them on. I'm like, let's yeah. go. And so far, it's it's kind of worked for me. Like, um, but the other thing then with the military is that you're expected to dress well, and well, you're you're expected to be presentable. Absolutely. All your your uniforms ironed, and your what, what's that box in your bed called? Your foot locker is yeah. always kept meticulous and and that probably would have played in a lot to how you now present yourself in that you take the extra oh, time yeah. to have your appearance up to scratch. Oh, that would definitely play in a lot. Yeah. I can remember when I was in the beginnings and the start of basic training. It seems like a hazy memory. It's quite a long time ago. And you would get your, like you're, you've just stepped into a whole new world and you'd be showing the basics and you've been they have to be held at an extremely mm. high standard, like, uh, at a level of excellence, like. And nothing and less. If, yeah, and nothing less. And if it's wrong, and fuck, I got it wrong quite a few times, and I still do. Um, but if it's wrong, everything will go out the fucking window. What will they everything. do? Everything. Your they... mattress, your bed, everything that you own, any little comforts you have. You show you show that little weakness to the comfort that you have there. That's out the fucking window in the dirt. Start again. That's crazy. Yeah, because that that's first thing in the morning inspection. Yeah, morning, afternoon, night, however many times it was. It's a long time ago now. So but tell yeah. people, tell people a little bit how you ended up there because it's a fascinating story. Yeah. Um, I was never an academic. I fucking hated school. Mm. I hated it. There was something internally telling me that this process isn't correct for for me. Mm. Um, some people thrive in it. Brilliant. A lot of a lot of young men struggle and women struggle in it. Um, it's something deeper where it's like this is wrong. I should. I don't need to be thinking like this. Mm. Um, and we can talk that about that more in depth if you want. So school wasn't for me and I left very young and I moved al around a lot of schools and got expelled from schools and suspended multiple times. It was almost like my parents were in school more than me dealing with <laughs> teachers and principals. Like, um, And there's a funny story when I'm really young, I think I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, maybe I was fifth class or whatever age you are there. And I came back um, and I, I can't, I have no, solid memory of this yeah it's my parents that tell me but i came back dropped the bag at the door of the house or whatever and was like that's me i'm done and they're like yeah you're done for the day and i was like nope i'm done i'm not going back i can read i can write add and subtract i've finished school and they're like it's not how it works it's not how it works like and they said from that moment that was it that's when my schooling because now I was forced to go into this mm. establishment that just didn't feel right to me. So they did keep forcing you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. For a couple of years? Oh, years, yeah. I, like, I was gone before... I left school before I was 15. Yeah. Um, because nothing had worked. And there was no other schools in Cork that I think would even take, look at me yeah. to take me on. Because like, what sort of mischief are you getting expelled and suspended for? Oh, all sorts. All sorts. Give us a, give us a few bits. Fighting was always the number one, like, do you know, fighting. Were you, arguing. were you sensitive to insults or were you just bored and looking for trouble? I think it was a good mix of both. I mean, like, I didn't have a clue who I was. I don't mm. think anyone does at these no, younger ages. Know. Like, you're always learning. Um, <clears throat> and I was, like, if it was now... I'd be a heavily sedated young man, I would say. Well, this is the thing, is that they'd, they'd start pumping you full of prescription oh, drugs yeah. just to keep you quiet in class. Yeah. There'd be a guard, a community officer coming oh, in to oh, address yeah. you, you'd be... Yeah. And the next thing you know, you're you're a long-term criminal because the system has pushed you into that category. This, this, that's it. That, that, know? Yeah. And, we're, and we're, that happens to a lot of young people. And it's, not? it's only happening more and more now as mm. we begin to enter into a stage where we... We want to try and put a label on everything. Yeah. And so if you're not conforming, 
and you're not responding to the usual methods which would be say like Ritalin or maybe something, maybe they give you some milder drugs or mm. maybe then they say well he's got ADHD and so we'll try to put yeah. him into special ed class and we'll try to do all these yeah. extra things for him and maybe they get you through to sixth year and you get your leaving cert and you have the scribe for your leaving cert or whatever mm. else but you're, you spend the rest of your life thinking you're a dunce thinking that I needed all the extra help I'm never going to succeed mm-hmm. and if, you, if, if the system wants to call that uh, a finished product whatever the system just isn't using the energy correctly well this is the thing and it was actually interesting because the last podcast I had which isn't out yet would well it will be out by the time this goes out what we ended up talking about education for nearly two hours mm. and so he's got the fella I had on multiple masters um, multiple college courses yeah uh, he's originally from Nigeria so he's a few courses there he's a few courses here he spent crazy amounts of money on education and all that he can come away from it is that it needs to be restructured. It needs to 100%. be. He calls it a rehabilitation or a rehaul. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the sort of aspects we looked at is how they view the children, and they're not building individuals capable of finding themselves and capable of of finding happiness and and what they're actually good at. They're effectively building parts for a machine. So yeah. they need people that fit a certain criteria so that they can do X number of jobs. Exactly. Yeah. Now, it's not so it's not like a horror movie esque where the children coming out in robotic states out of these warehouses, but there's no it doesn't seem to be thought giving to what's really important in developing individuals. Yes. So you've got I think it's the Einstein quote of if you judge a fish and its ability to climb a tree it will go its entire life thinking it's stupid and that's currently one of the problems with the education system is that we're ascribing that everyone can fit this particular mm-hmm. framework and if you can't well then there must be something wrong with you and you're just a problem for society yeah but you see you you were kind of in that area era where there was enough students like you that you so you effectively fell through the cracks you know oh, yeah. if, if people look back now they'd say the system failed you yeah but inadvertently it almost did you a favour because it allowed you to leave Definitely. and make your own path Definitely. and allowed you to effectively find yourself. Yep. So yep. You, your parents kept you in school. They made you continue for another couple of years. <laughs> they did. That relationship at home must have been very stressful. Very stressful. Um, yeah, some interesting times there. Because that plays into it as well, you see. Definitely does, yeah. Um, yeah, there was some interesting times through my youth growing up because I most certainly wasn't an angel outside of school or inside of school like um, them paths run side by side I think mm. and but leaving school and getting handed a, a shovel and a brush by my dad and saying we'll work then I was like okay and at the time uh, when I left school it was the only thing that you could do mm. was get a trade go into construction mm. was, that, that was your only option it really was your only option back in the late 90s early to early 2000s sorry yeah you know it was like well a trade it is and your father was a tradesman was yeah he? yeah okay. he is yeah so i just found myself brushing and shoveling shit <laughs> do you know um which i learned a lot from as well when i when i look back at it mm. i learned a lot from from starting at that rock bottom. Mm. Um, so Every person needs to go being, through that stage they of rock do. bottom. They have to. have to. And that was at a very young age. And I've hit rock bottom through multiple ages. Mm. Um, but that was a good start. And I knew I was... It, even though I was working on sites or whatever, I knew that was the right start to my yes. path. Like, I was out of... It was like the chains were off me. And yeah. What I didn't know at the time was the world is there to be explored, but that soon comes into it. Like. And so how many years did you stay working on sites? And I left Ireland at 17. So not long after not leaving long, school? Not long, three years, yeah. I would say. And were they still a troublesome three years? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, things didn't settle down once you no, got out of school? No, things only escalated. Because <laughs> um, now you're actually Now, now I had some finances yeah. myself, like... <laughs> And then I, I put them finances into different different things, playing around and making more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
with loads of different things with drugs a lot of drinking um a bit of scamming yeah because that was robbing. that was the air for it though because there was so I'm much money you. in the country in the early 2000s yeah you know that was just in that build up to the boom mm. there were some some violently vo- volatile years yeah when, when it comes to those sort of industries yeah. and there was nothing and i like we're getting better most certainly but there was nothing for us there was nothing like unless you were into gaa but that's which i wasn't i i'm not a, I fucking hated going around kicking a ball and stuff. It wasn't for me. Because <clears throat> it was too easy for me to point the finger at someone or someone point the finger at me and say mm. that it all went wrong because of this. I much preferred individualized tasks. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Where it's all on me. You see, Put it all the weight on my shoulders and it's on me if it... If it fails. If it fails or succeeds, yeah. See, because it's strange because when you say the early 2000s, it doesn't seem that long no, ago. No, no. Like it's on paper, it's twenty, just on twenty years, yeah. and I, I, it's I, like I'm, I'm struggling to get my head around the fact that there wasn't the facilities for young people that there is now mm-hmm. in just that short space of time. Because like yeah. the last couple of guests I've had on, I've been all well older than I me, mean, so when they talk about their childhoods, we're going back to like the eighties and seventies yeah. or some of them, and yeah, yeah. And when so when you say the two thousands, it trips well, me up was, in my head. Yeah, that's when I was in. That age group between mm. fourteen and seventeen, yeah. like those. But there were still not there. There was no youth clubs. No, like, yeah. yeah. And so then, what? Where did you get the idea to leave the country? I kind of had to leave. Um, <laughs> I kind of had to leave. We'll leave, we'll leave it here. We'll leave it. Yeah. 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 Fuck. Um, but everything's for a reason, as they say, isn't it? And I got a one-way ticket mm. and flew out to Australia. Why Australia? It was the furthest... At the time, I hated Ireland. I fucking hated it. Mm. I hated the people around me. I just... There was... I was so disconnected from myself. And when you're disconnected from yourself, you can't accept anything else. Like, But that, in, then again, looking back, you can see that you're disconnected from yourself, but you don't know what yourself is. That's it. Yeah. So, in, effectively, you actually weren't disconnected. You were just unfamiliar yet with what Very you were looking unfamiliar. for. Very Yeah. And <clears throat> it all became too comfortable for me. I say I, li- I quite like uncomfortable situations. Mm. Um, and putting myself out there and taking the risk in an uncomfortable to try and overcome it and become comfortable in that situation. Mm. Through multiple different techniques that I've learned over the years, like, or I've been trained in over the years as well. Um, but yeah, it was as far as... If, get me as far away from Ireland as I could mm. so it was a one way flight and you were 17 I was 17 I was only a baby I look at some 17 year olds now and I was like holy wow yeah I at left that at age, that age I like, was getting on a plane on my own yeah. not looking back yeah whereas nowadays 17 year olds can barely wipe their noses like. some of them yeah some of them yeah Where'd which you is have... unfortunate it is yeah it is mm-hmm. but it is what it is, you know. Yeah. It's, it's the way things are going. Development is slowing seem, down. Seen that way, yeah. Um, so where did you fly into in Australia? Can you remember? Where did it? I fly into Brisbane? Okay. Brisbane, yeah, Queensland. And what was happening in Australia at the time? Can you remember? Was it this? Buzzing, this this was, it? was like kind of before. I always call. I always laugh and say the invasion of the Irish on Australia. Yeah. This was before that. That was po- that was post two thousand and eight. That was when the crash oh, happened. Oh yeah, this is two thousand and four. I left. Yeah, I think yeah. the end of two thousand and three, start two thousand and four. I think it was. Um, and there was a sense of complete freedom when you got there, which I loved. Which is yeah, when I got there, when I touched down, there was that nervous energy. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, let's start this see where we go and so what did you do you got off the plane you'd know where to st- had you anywhere to stay yet had you yeah had I, had, I, had I you? did have a cousin who was uh, who I grew up with and he was in Australia at the time which is why it was probably a lure for me yeah like I was attracted to it because I grew up with him since I was since I was born and had he, he'd gone over and there he was over on there his own on his own as well with yeah. a one way ticket as well yeah. the same sort of oh he was there maybe a year or two before me before I arrived um, 
so I stayed with him for maybe a week and I was like right I've had enough time to go and I just went off on my travels where did you go? I think I went all the way down to Melbourne first of all hitchhiking or? Um, I think I got a bus I'm trying to remember it and then I went to Sydney and I set up a base in Sydney then for a while and were you just going to hostels and going hostels yeah did you sleep rough at all? In Australia, I yeah. did, but that, that comes a little bit later. Okay. I had um, I some really interesting encounters with rangers and the police over there. Four sleeping rough. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, how were you making money at that in the first couple of weeks? When you were I wasn't. There? I was. I was kind of just burning the money that I had saved uh, through working at home. Yeah. And through getting oh, money in different yeah, areas yeah. when I was over here. Um and I was just burning through that and then there was a matter of time before I started work like I was just absorbing everything like a sponge when mm. I was over there though um, and there was loads of opportunity on the sites again you were on, still on yeah, sites yeah. yeah that was the only thing I knew and at, at that point that was all you were planning to do was just work on sites make a lot of money and uh, yeah and just move and, and then move yeah. yeah and just keep moving I'd work I'd travel to a place I'd get a job on a site for two weeks or whatever it was doing whatever it was mm. I'd always kind of I told some group when, when I went to New Zealand I was telling them that I was a fully qualified carpenter <laughs> um, and this isn't the days there was no paperwork like, yeah, yeah. I was like alright um, and I ended up getting sponsorship in New Zealand as well um, which I turned down the last second mm. sponsorship in order to stay there long term to stay there long term yeah under your bluff of a under carpenter under my bluff some fella was like, Jesus, he's such a good cop, and yeah, we better keep I him. I swear to God, yeah. And you had no experience with it. Great him. group of men over there I was working with, yeah, it was fucking great. So mm. you're still buzz- anyway, you're yeah. still buzzing around Australia. Yeah. When, when you go for work, are you walking onto a site? You're walking going, on. Who's the foreman? Yeah. Here, I'll do whatever work you want. Pretty much, yeah. That's how I was doing it. And I just went in with kind of like the fake it till you make it kind of attitude. Yeah. I went in there fully confident that I was going to get a job yeah. on this site. And I would sure enough get a job on the site. And did you usually always get it? Usually. Yeah. Usually, yeah. For a couple of weeks or whatever it is until I had enough money to get on a bus or get on a plane. And you go and cruise do it, again. Do it again do it somewhere again. else. Spend it all and do it again. And so would you even, would you tell the foreman, hey, I'm leaving next week or anything? Or were you yeah, sort no, of... no, I was telling him, okay. I'm, I'm here for a month. Okay. Anything I can do. This is my skill set. He's like, are they? And they put you to work and out they there. they put you in there. Yeah. That's crazy, man. Yeah. And so you're Good moving times. to different parts of Australia. Different parts. Wherever you... Out in the outback, all along the coast. I did the full circle of Australia. Over how many years? Uh, two years, I think it was. But that was bouncing between different visas around New Zealand as well. Like. Yeah, because Dara, mm. Dara ran into visa problems in Australia mm. as well, and they shipped them back. Great podcast, they, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a good podcast, mm. man. I'm, that Dara is it. If you haven't seen that podcast, guys, you need yeah. to go see it. It's an absolute cracking podcast. But definitely, he, uh, you're actually quite. You remind me a lot of him because mm. you're both that free spirit, but honest and there's there's no. There's no BS with you. It it no. is as you say it, mm. and if you don't want to talk about something, you won't talk about something. Yeah. But when you talk about something, it's like, look, this is the situation that we had. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's a good few similarities between you, especially with the visas in Australia, and like, because how does it work? Can you have a visa for one part of Australia and not for the other side? No. Or is, for, it, is, is it free travel once you're there? Pretty much. I think it was. Yeah, I think so. As far as I can remember, um, it was. Yeah, it was free travel. But when you head out into the outback, there's surely no building sites going on out there. Like, oh, will it be farms or anything? Yeah, anything. and you walk up to a random farm yeah, and be like, "Here, not a problem." And we're on these parts for the next little yeah, while. Need some fencing done, whatever it was. And mm. would you sleep under the stars? Many times, yeah, yeah, it was good. Oh, that's savage. It's good, man. savage, like just for, with yourself for food. And how did you get by on clothing? They kind of look after me a lot. Okay. Clothing, I'm not too fussed. Do you know well, you are now I, oh yeah I, 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 <laughs> back then but yeah and then I got a job then I met um, I think his name was Mick of course yeah of course Mick, Mick in Australia of course it fucking was Mick but anyway he was a carpenter and he took me on 
and he had a he had a contracting job in Sydney, one of the army barracks in Sydney. Mm-hmm. So that was my first introduction to a military, a re, a mil, a military establishment. Tell me yeah. first about New Zealand, because were you f- going over and back to New Zealand while you were in Australia? Yeah. Whenever you wanted to, or yeah, did I was you have reason on? I don't know what they are. The holiday visas, three month visas. Okay. I was kind of working on them, and, and I was I was working cash in hand as well. At the yeah, time, yeah, yeah. You know, get whenever jobs I could. So I was just kind of bouncing around. Who was willing to sponsor you? Uh, a group of men. I don't even know how I met them now. I was trying to think about it. Because um, I have some issues that I want to try and revisit uh-huh. at these younger ages. like, And I was trying to remember. I can't, can't put my finger on how I met them. But anyway, they were working for an English man over in just outside of Auckland. And this English man was extremely wealthy. Mm. And he had huge vineyards. And he was building these beautiful we'll say colonial kind of style houses within mm. the middle of the vineyards mm. and you were buying a portion of the vineyard whenever you bought the house and this was over massive acreage and um, I got a job as a carpenter on site there with the small team in New Zealand yeah New Zealand men and I got on really really well with all of them and the owner of the site mm-hmm. and they offered me my sponsorship. My sponsorship, yeah. And I went through everything. I went through absolutely everything. Um and all the only thing that had to be done was it posted off. That was pretty much it. That was all that had to be done. However, I got invited to the main house one evening. Um this man had his his wife was French. Yeah. And he had two younger sons, just a little bit younger than me. And he brought me down to the house, which was unreal. And we sat down and had dinner. And then he just sort of gave me an offer. And it was like, listen, um, my niece is coming over from France. I, she wants to travel New Zealand. However, she's never left France. I want you to take her around New Zealand. And I was like, what about work? He's like, yeah, don't worry about work. Now, is, like, it, I want is this to, the English? Is this, this the is English, English, man? This the English yeah. man who's doing the whole the whole setup in yeah. the vineyards over there? And I was like, oh great! And he, I was like, okay, no problem if you want me to do that. And he just handed me over a gold card, and he was like, everything's on me. He was like, do your thing, give her the best experiences you can traveling around New Zealand, and that took me out of the work state of mind, like, and I was back traveling again. However, I was traveling with money. And with, what, and, with, and, and with whatever I wanted to do, do you know? Was she around whatever the same age as you? Yeah, same age as me. Was she but, a cutie? Uh, I, I never got with her, if that's, what ah! you know, if that's what you're trying to get to. No, I never got with her. Serious? Um, I swear to God. And how I, long were you with her? I, I, I respected him and his wife so much, yeah. I, I wouldn't put that at jeopardy. Oh, man, I have massive respect for mm. that now. And I'm still, I'm only, what age am I? 18, I'd say. At this time, and he's bankrolled you to go. He's all bankrolled me to do whatever I want to do in New Zealand and show her the best. That is incredible. As you can, yeah. Experience, man. However, after a couple of months of that, and we finally arrived back, and I'm looking at the sponsorship forms there to work on this vineyard yeah. for the next 10, 12 years, I was like, no, nope. itchy feet. Yeah. I need to get moving again. You felt those chains, chains beginning to catch up. With you yeah. Again. Yeah. But that was a cool, cool. And was was there bad blood after that then? No, when you went to none leave? whatsoever. They were like, we fully get you. Fully get you. Man, you fell in with a good crowd. I, there. Absolutely, absolutely. Because there's some people who turn on you if, if you turn down an opportunity mm-hmm. like that. They'd hate you for it. Yeah. So then you you say your goodbyes and you go back to Australia. Back to Australia. And so then where did the barracks come into play then? Yeah, it was after, after that. that. Yeah, after that. And was there a connection within that group that set you no. up at the barracks? No. So how did you end up I fixing doors I, in the, the barracks? Um, things were slowly starting to change. You had to have all your tickets, like your safe passes mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I had to go down through an agency to start getting work on sites. But they hooked me up with this this fellow, Mick. Mm-hmm. And then he had the, the contracting job for the military barracks. So you rock on, 
Mm -hmm. you watch them they're training they're busting doors and you're coming in to repair them and all the that while was it. That was you're it. surrounded yeah. by these ultra men carrying these weapons exactly. and this gear yeah and you your brain starts churning absolutely yeah that was it I was just I'd say taking it all in and I'm looking at these men stacked up and the clearing the houses and breaching through the doors or the windows or whatever way whatever whatever they were drilling whatever they were drilling at the time yeah and using helis to come in and fast rope and I was like just in complete awe of it mm. and I was like that's it sign me up yeah sign me up and at the time this is what 2003 2004, 2004 say yeah when you mentioned 2004 I was like I could, the propaganda machine is in full flow yeah like, like we don't have nothing that we have mm -hmm. now um, even when I think about it and I was speaking with my parents a couple of weeks ago I was like I had to use I had to go to the corner shop get a phone card swipe it and use it in a phone box to call home like there was no fucking Facebook or any of that stuff or WhatsApp. And again, that's only that's only it's, a short it's, time yeah, ago. That's not long ago at all. So my information was coming from the papers and the news, like mm -hmm. whatever I seen. And at the time, of course, after um, nine eleven, it was all about the war on terror. Yeah. So I was definitely taking all of that in, and then I was looking at these men, and I was like, yeah. I need to do this. And so how long did I you... Need to, I, I need to get get to war. How long did you remain fixing doors before you enlisted? Not long at all. A couple, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of weeks, I'd say. And I rang home. I can remember speaking to my dad. And I was like, I'm joining the army. And he laughed at me. And he said, you'll last two weeks. And I was like, really? Okay, we'll see. And I didn't speak to him. For a long time, mm -hmm. through my entire training, mm. you know. Mm. And how long was that training? I can't even remember. Eight months, maybe. Yeah, I'd say like it was that. about eight yeah. months or something like that. Yeah. And so you you enlist in Australia, part of the Commonwealth, and at the so at the, that time you were just like, do they did they deploy you straight after no. you were trained? No, no. So you go you, through, you spe depending on what's happening at the time and what kind of rotation the unit you attach yourself to is on will depend on what you're doing. Well, Australia um, were involved in Afghanistan, were, weren't they? Yeah, there was probably about 43 different nations that was involved in Afghanistan. Right? This, people don't realise how many no countries idea. got involved in this. Yeah. Like, uh, America gets the blame for a lot of it, obviously, yeah. and with, with good reason. But you think... Maybe, okay, some of the major countries have probably had their hand in it. Like, yeah, understandable. Mm. But when you say 40, over 40 I would countries. I there was, yeah. It's, that's, that's bonkers. Mm. Like small units. Yeah. Like, of course, you had. But a little contribution. American from, and the British held the most amount yeah. of troops there on the ground. Like. Yeah. Um, but small little contributions from multiple different nations. Mm. So you're chilling in Australia while this war is going on in Afghanistan? Yeah, and I just got. Like, I followed it yeah. deeply. And I got um, into a lot of military history, as I was saying to you. And the Irish man's kind of contribution to wars around the world. And were you, were you, you were obviously sucked into the narrative, though, that was going around. So, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It had you... Oh, I wanted to go. Like, yeah. I wanted to go. Um, I didn't want to be a soldier and not... Like not do it, not be a soldier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now I understand there's multiple different avenues to soldiering with peacekeeping and all that kind of mm. stuff, such as the Irish Defence Force. But I wanted to be in the team. Oh uh, yeah, that's what I wanted, and I, I I prepared my mind for that for a long time. I was visualizing it, feeling it, what reading as much as I could into it, just because that's what I wanted. Like, and did that help? Do you think? I don't know is the answer to that I don't know mm. Mm. I'd like to say it did help um, mm. maybe it set my subconscious for, it helped me in my subconscious as such well, for when I did eventually go at the very least what it would have done is it would have sort of opened your subconscious to expect something mm -hmm. horrific mm -hmm. now it's different when you're there and you can see it and you can smell it you yes. can taste it 
like no amount of paperwork is ever going to prep you for that moment no. but what can happen is that you can be more willing to accept the things you see with the preparation that you put in beforehand oh yeah the preparation Cause before we, deploying is intense because we had this conversation <clears throat> a week or two back where you're like you're still 19 what age are you like you're still young age yeah i'm 20 maybe 20 and at like, the time like they're taking in children into the military like that you're talking 17 year olds yep they, they've barely gotten out of nappies and the next thing they're being told all this information well this is what's happening this is who you now yeah. are you now have to do this job and it's it's out absolute vital importance that you do x y and z but when when you look back you realize like at that age it's too young it's, it's too young man. like i was but you need them I that was, young because mature. it's a lot harder to convince mm-hmm. a 25 year old to give up his life for a cause that he doesn't understand than a 17 mm-hmm. year old and it's amazing how just in that short space of of development you won't recruit too many older people mm-hmm. i think that if the opportunity for me to join at 16 when I was in that kind of manic stage mm. of growing up, I, it probably would have been a good way of focusing my energy. Mm. However, it doesn't benefit. Mm. Um, like when I joined the military, I was quite mature. I had traveled. Mm. I'd experienced, I said, there's a lot of 16, 17, 18 year olds that joined the military and they've never left their home mm. they're still within the embrace of their mother and father a lot of them mm. uh, depending on of course the individual circumstances like but yeah it's too young and we see a lot of backlash of being too young mm. in the military and when they leave and they have a lot of kind of PTSD or whatever it may be from mm. it mm. and a lot of that kind of stems from the initial shock that takes place I when think so. they transition from one existence to the other yeah Definitely. So how many years, how long before you eventually got deployed from signing up, roughly? Um, maybe three years. Okay. I think it was about wow. three years, yeah. That's long enough. I'm yeah. surprised about that. It was a long time. Because I always had in my head that militaries would want to get you blooded as soon as possible. No, no. I'd say it depends what kind of rotation you're in. Yeah. What unit you're in, what brigade you're in. It all depends. So you were trained for all those years. Oh, I was and itching. And just biting at the bit completely get me out there i was like let me prove myself like and were you because i'm i'm surrounded by veterans like <laughs> who've been out there and who've done the job and who have been tested and all i wanted to do was be tested and see where i stand as a man and did you try push to get out there yeah. sooner yeah and they were like you'll go when you're ready yeah you'll go when when we need you'll you go, to go when when the unit's ready to deploy yeah, yeah. and then even when I did go um, on my first tour. I didn't want to leave it. I was saying to my, to the hierarchy and to my officers, I'll stay happily. happily. And they were like, you're crazy, man. Yeah, they were like, you need to get home. I was like, I'm quite comfortable. Give me another couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. I'll stay here with the next, the, the, the takeover mm. of the next unit who's coming out. Yeah. And so can I ask where you were deployed for your first tour? My first deployment that was frontline. Yeah. I uh, will say war as such or frontline proper operational um was Afghanistan. And so tell me that experience of touching down for the first time, getting out into that heat, mm-hmm. seeing now it's I assume it's all sort of desert camo mm-hmm. and it's it is it like you see in documentaries and, and movies and stuff, that sort of dusty, plain, very military base. Yeah, the, ba- the bases are exactly how you would probably see them. Like, do you like know? did you fly in on a military plane? Like, yeah. Yeah, you course, were yeah. booking your ticket to, <laughs> to, 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 to no. wherever, no. No, yeah. So you touch down with your unit, mm-hmm. and you're out there, and those first few moments, that nervous energy we talked about earlier, was that present? It's an anticipate, like... Because you're with a, 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 a unit, and this is every time, like, every time you touch down, it's just kind of like the look, and it's like, okay, let's get to work. But there is that kind of slightly anxious feel, but 
there's an excitement to it as well mm. yeah and how much comfort do you have when you're on deployment like do they try and make your life at base as smooth and as easy as possible depending who you're serving with and what unit you're with like, okay. you know but yes they will you will try however I on one of my deployments I lived out of a hole pretty much um, in a in a compound that I'm sure was paid off for us to jump into like you know I just lived out of a hole in the wall. So you arrive onto the base. Are you debriefed when you first arrive? Yeah, you've you've got like um You know what you're there for. Yeah. A and preparation time. Yeah. You have that time to prepare. And so when you're there ready. then how many days, how many weeks before you're actually sent into where they need you to go? Depends again. Okay. Depends. Sometimes I say with different units as well, you might touch the ground and you're in. And you you go to where is needed to go. Yeah. Or you have that kind of lay down period prepare get your background in the areas that you're going to and are you able to talk about not what you did but the initial time you remember getting into the Humvee or whatever vehicle and moving to where you needed to go yeah well at the time I wasn't with any sort of um, vehicle vehicle moves on the ground it was all through the air okay. so it was heli drop offs yeah straight into the middle of it like. yeah it's a good it's a it's an interesting time <laughs> from me to you away on a heli and you get told like a minute out 30 seconds out and what's 10 the, seconds what's out. the environment like in that helicopter um it's tense you know what you need to do They're, like bef uh, as you take off as such there's a bit of banter a good yeah. bit of crack but, but when, you once guess. you get that countdown from the load master whoever's controlling things on the heli on the airframe it's okay switch on time now let's go mm. yeah <laughs> and coming back from day one like yeah coming back from day one then mm -hmm. did you have all your bodies with you like was it was it as crazy as, as the news reports made it out yeah it's dropping just... left right and center it yeah. really was like that yeah and like, did you lose many people that were close to you? Yeah, I lost quite a few friends. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of lads injured as well. Mm. Mm. Are you shipped home as soon as you're injured? If it's serious? No, enough? no. Oh, if you're injured? Yeah. Uh, there's a process. There's a process. Okay. Uh, where if, you fly to and get your initial treatment, then go through your rehabilitation <clears throat> or whatever it may be. I am fortunate enough I didn't get seriously injured or injured at all. What was your worst injury? Because you, you had that moment with your on, eye. On the ground? Oh, yeah, that yeah. was just on a, a complete task. I've done my knees. I've had surgery on me, both of my knees. For what? Eye injury, uh, meniscus and ACL repair, yeah. That's just yeah. that's run-of-the-mill injury. That's just run-of-the-mill kind of stuff. Do you have any yeah. serious ones? No, no, very fortunate. A few of my friends do. Mm. Yeah. And are you still in contact? Like, when you're in that unit... Do you form long lasting, like obviously you form lasting bonds with them, but are you still connected with a lot of those people? Yeah, it's different and it's difficult, especially when you leave. Because um, when you're in there, you are like, you're a unit. It's yeah. a full brotherhood, like, and there could be, <clears throat> depending on what squadron or whatever it may be, there, there's, there's a good group of you in there. Mm. It could be eight, 12 men, your sections, whatever it is, or your platoons. Um, or your company you might have a hundred hundred men in there mm. and it's a solid united kind of brotherhood mm. Mm. but then out of all of the men that I've served with I probably have five close friends that I know I'll have for life mm. and you'd yeah. be still in regular contact oh with god them. Yeah. yeah yeah. and were there any other Irishmen in there with you there was yeah the Irish boy we get everywhere there's another Cork man who's a very good friend of mine ah uh, what yeah and yeah. were they serving? Who were they serving? Gal with? Galway man, um, who's probably one of the best snipers I've ever been alongside. Yeah. And who were they serving with? Different units, different but units. Yeah. Australia, England. Oh no, the um, British and American. British and American. Yeah. Okay. There was yeah. Irish boys in them. Yeah. There's yeah. a co co yeah. couple of different um, Irish guys that I met serving with French units as well, like John. And it's like an instant. You hear the accent, and it's like. I see, I see it where, where are you and then is that instant connection because of that commonality 
Yeah, the, there's much more of a connection than if yeah. if you were with a person from a different area. Yeah. Like, yeah, do you know? You can just talk about home or whatever it is. Yeah. And again, you don't have to answer this one now, but can you remember your first kill? Um, There's an interesting... So I put myself... I said I was living in this little hut, this hole beside a sentry position yeah. or a sanger, a built up position where you have good arcs of the area around you and you work from that area yeah. within this compound or your patrol base or whatever it may be. And I put myself, I was like, I want the bed beside that so that I can react Instantly. immediately, immediately. And I'd have my helmet there and my body armor right at the door yeah. so as soon as i was out i was straight up and i was on on location and engaging whatever targets were needed but there's multiple men engaging at the same time do you know as in multiple yeah but, but what you call them sentry no the, the sentries is it yeah, yeah, your you, sentry positions you or your sangers or whatever sangers. Maybe. yeah sangers yeah so you've multiple you've sangers. multiple that yeah you, you'll have 360 yeah. arcs around okay. wherever you are like and are you snipers Am I a sniper? No. It, it, oh, in, would in, we have snipers? Yeah. But in the Sanger, sa- say, say, Sangers. Sangers. Yeah. Were they sniper holes or were you no, talking? No, it was more machine machine, guns he- heavy machine guns. Okay. Yeah. Heavy machine guns. So go on your first. Your yeah. First. Well, there's a there could be six of you engaging multiple targets mm-hmm. all at the same time. And these these are rebel forces or these would be Taliban. Yeah. Yeah. And they're coming for your position, or or they're passing by, and you open fire. Like you're in obviously areas that require you to be there. Yeah. And are the Taliban trying to take these key areas. Oh yeah. But is is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, we it are. Is that sort of you're literally dropped into possession. Yeah, I, I served a lot of time in Helmand, um, in the green zone over there, and that was a hornet's nest of Taliban, like. Hmm. And that's, you are dropped. And it's constant. And trying to gain ground. Oh, yeah, it's, it was constant. It was constant. Until we... Sort of. Until, until you push the enemy back. Yeah. And you gain that ground. And you're gaining that ground. Not... You're gaining that ground for the people of that area. Mm. You know? Mm. And that's, that's, what, that's the sort of ideas you have in your head. Because you see, you, you obviously have natives there as well. Who yeah. Oh, were, yeah. Who have to engage with. And... They some look, of them not. So. They look to you as heroes. I wouldn't think so, no. No? No. Okay. So even the people that you were directly... So. In they were very thankful for particular circumstances, especially if any of their own children got injured or mm. were treated badly from Taliban forces. Mm. We would do our best to help any of the locals in the area. Mm. Mm. So your first kill that you... I, I, well there was multiple there was multiple um, engagements as I say yeah every single day yeah um, where we worked as a unit and say I wasn't a sniper so there wasn't that kind of individual Body moment yeah. yeah 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 I know what you mean with an enemy we were a unit all fighting together and that's all that's how we worked so well together we were one mm. we were a solid team of men and you are you you build these connections like you might not particularly like one or two of the individ- individuals within your squadron or section or whatever it may be but, regardless, but when regardless you'll you'll take the hit for one of them in the moment no problem hmm. yeah so you're working as a unit and you're gauging in multiple targets and if like, you can go into the whole political side of things, but that doesn't even cross your mind out there. No. You're only trying to keep your muckers left and right of you alive and try and keep yourself alive. Mm. Yeah. And with those big, heavy artillery machine guns, is there much, <laughs> of, a, is there much of a kick off them? Depends what weapon you're firing. Um, Did you artillery's a whole different thing, though, too. Okay. Um, but the machine guns, yeah, you've got multiple different calibers, yeah. And did you have a preferred weapon of choice? Yeah, there's a, a light machine gun I really like. 
And what was it about it that you liked? It was just the firepower that it could put out there. Yeah. To suppress the enemy for flanking maneuvers or whatever mm. it may be. Mm. And at that stage, it's just go for it, like hell for letter, open fire. Not hell for letter as such. Everything is tactical. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what about your ears and and like is it is it that loud? Like do you have long term oh. ear damage. When there's when the bullets are whizzing past you and hitting around your feet or hitting off the walls beside you or sometimes striking lads in the helmet or the body armor or whatever it is Pew. and then yeah well not exactly that but um once you're in a, a baseline of fire or whatever it may be and you're engaging with the enemy and you could be using all sorts of different assets whether it's fast air or AH or so attack heli uh, helicopters or mm -hmm. whatever it may be or you could be using your units mortars or mm. artillery um yeah there's some noise out there and you've no ear protection while you're ah, out yeah, there you'd have a bit you of do. ear protection yeah and you can still hear yeah. people around you and are you yeah. are you radioed up yeah, yeah. all your helmets yeah. are radioed yeah. yeah okay so you did they let you stay on then no they didn't they, no. they sent you home Fuck, i wish they did just like your, at the time just like your mother with school it was you're gone you're gone mm. yeah then you have your decompressive stage. Well, that's what I was going to say, is how rough is the anticlimax when you come back? Like, because there's obviously a transition yeah. period where you move from being in active combat to, okay, I'm, I'm back on friendly ground. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. How, how tough is you that? You need to decompress, definitely. I don't recommend just walking off the plane and going home. Like, So when, when you say decompress? Just with... Staying with your unit, staying with your section or squadron or whatever it is, and just decompressing together, whether that be going out, doing a little bit of adventurous training together, a mm. bit of drinking. And how long does it take to sort of decompress? Um, it can take a while. It can t it's, it's different time frames for different people and what they've done and how they, how they analyse the situations that they've been in. Like. Mm. It takes time. It does um, take time. Were you living on the military base then when you came back? Yeah. yeah. And other people were going back to their homes maybe? Locals. Yeah, other people would have had their families close yeah. by. Their wives or whatever it may be and their children. And were yeah. there many people in your category that mm. were just single men yeah. with no baggage? And yeah, just quite a lot. Quite a lot. But you had each other. Mm. You had each other, you know. But you see, the argument is that, that they're almost the most effective soldiers because mm. they don't have all this emotional cloudiness Yeah. with their decision-making. It depends how you take yourself away uh, and your perception on that. Some people can shut that out really well um, and can be completely focused. And that's just being extremely disciplined and professional mm. and having that disciplined, professional mindset. With the knowledge that you've a wife and kids back home yeah. you can still have individuals with the ability to I think so yeah yeah because that's extremely tough extremely tough like I'm very fortunate I didn't have to battle those kind of demons mm. like, um because I would have I wouldn't have came home too often whatsoever mm. you know and so mm. how long before they allow you to redeploy then you're you're back in the cycle okay oh wow so yeah so you could have another year or two yeah you, you could have another get... two years before you go out and at that stage, you're back in just normal training. Or another, depending on what units you're with again. Like. But I mean, when you're back on base, it's just back into what you were doing before. Just more drilling, more training. Just the Yeah, you have routine. that decompression period. And that that does take its time. How long do they give even you? Through, even through the military. Um, you might have a couple of... You might have two months or something. Okay. Yeah. You might have two months. And, and then you'll slowly start getting back in during that two months so mm -hmm. they don't expect you to to do military tasks they're not expecting ah, you'll still have you'll still have your day to day admin and such oh, okay. but you're not going out on uh, mentor mentoring other foreign nations or going on to we'll say heavy of exercises or anything like that at okay. the time like. but you are or still drilling and still yeah. drilling okay. little things and slowly getting back into it but that can be a bit flat because mm. you've just came from the height of it. The height of it. Mm. Mm. So that can be a bit flat, 
and I kind of struggled with that. I was like, "Why the fuck am I doing this? Cause you I've got to do this. I've just, just done this for, I've just just done this for real." Hmm. And how long was your first deployment? Uh, seven know? months, I think it was. Okay. Yeah. And did you feel that you didn't need this decompression time? I th- like I, as I said, I wanted to stay out there. Yeah. And serve with the next unit coming in. Hmm. But. No. And so then, after that, you had how many more deployments? A few more. Yeah. A few more in different different locations. Different locations. Like, yeah. yeah. But there was two more of of Afghanistan, particularly. Like, okay. Yeah. So you had three tours of Af- yeah. Afghanistan with Australia. No. With a few different. A few different places. units. Yeah. Because that's something some people don't really know is that there is a movement between friendly nations of their troops. Now it's it's not talked about really a lot mm. but I've met other people who've had those moments within. yeah you'd be working with yeah. different different units and within the commonwealth like and you'd be working with American British forces anytime uh, you mentoring move, groups with French around Africa and things like that as well anytime you move do you have to sign more paperwork and sign non-disclosures or you, depend on what unit you're serving with you will yeah okay yeah and so when you're mentoring people in North Africa mm-hmm you're mentoring local police forces and military forces on how to combat things like say for example Somalia yeah you've all the pirates around yeah. the coast of Somalia are you mentoring the local forces to dealing with pirates you'd be mentoring their military okay you know and just add into their add into their base that they already have of their skill set and you get well paid for things like mentoring and no, no. You're, st- you're still on the way. You you have little subsidies and mm. such. You get a little bit more when you're abroad, of course, but it's, it's not an extravagant whatsoever. Yeah. Which is always what I've mad. had friends in the Irish Army and the Irish Defence Forces getting paid a lot more than me and to go to the lab um, than I was on the front line in a green zone or working through different cities or whatever it may be mm. you see it's it's strange because it's almost it sort of mirrors what you want in I, in I, well no it doesn't it's, it mirrors what happens if you're happy doing what you love yeah it nullifies a little of the desire to make lots of money yeah and so there's, there's some a lot of people like Dara, for example. He's mm. not looking to become a millionaire. Nah. He has yeah. his family. He has simple things that he does every day that he enjoys. Mm-hmm. And if he gets paid, happy days. And if he's able to make his bills, happy days. And so it's almost, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously a, a more economic thing in terms of why the military aren't paid more. But there almost seems like that's the comparison, that the military life gives you so much more than money ever can that yeah. they allow... The paychecks to drop in order for you to have these experiences. Yeah, that's funny that you say that because there's a say <laughs> if times were a bit, depending where you were uh, and what exercise you were on, but if times are a little bit tough, we'd always say to each other, cities pay for this. So that's funny that you mentioned mm. that. Yeah. Mm. And like, because a lot of. Was was there, was there an area you, you enjoyed the most? Not in the military, but was there a deployment or a country or a particular exercise or task that you were like, yes, I get to do that again? I loved it all. Yeah. Until, like, I loved it all. I did, I really enjoyed it all. Like, there's tough times, of course, yeah. but tough times make tough people, as they say. Yeah. You know? Um, and I liked the uncomfortable, I liked... I think we need that. We need that struggle. Yeah. People don't struggle enough. There's people an abundance of everything. Yeah. People assume if you're having a struggle, there's something wrong. Yeah. That someone's you cheating need that. Them somewhere. You like, need yeah. that. You do. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it. I love being a soldier. Like, I absolutely mm. loved it. But, like, circumstances, certain circumstances lead you down particular paths. Like, so how come you're now sitting here talking to me? Running a barber shop in Cork. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? How did that come about? <laughs> um, I've been cutting hair since I was thirteen. Okay. Thirteen, cutting me buddy's hair, cutting me own hair. Shout out, Glenn Lawless. Glenn Lawless, you're up, boy. You gotta get out and get into the military. 
<laughs> one of my mates from okay. back home by he, right. he grew up cutting hair around Dublin. Oh, uh, brilliant! Yeah. Dublin, yeah, mm. and uh, ends up now he's, he's his trade is his full time profession. Brilliant. Good on him. Yeah. So you were doing the same. You I was just, doing the same, but it was just for something to do. Butcher cuts. It was, oh, loads Big of them. Jagged loads of them. fringes dad, and steps and. Oh, yeah. the works. The <laughs> works of it. Um, my dad has had some dodgy haircuts because he's. <laughs> he, yeah. He was a model for many years, like many years. It's a, it's surprising with the relationship you you had with him for a while that he let you behind us. Yeah. With the scissors. <laughs> relationship that relationships are interesting that way, especially when it comes to, um your parents and especially with your father like mm. that kind of male bond and relationship mm. yeah and when it when it isn't going very well it's it's very painful it can and be it, it's yeah because you've got two strong individuals yeah with each exactly other. yeah yeah so you're cutting hair and just, just for the crack that just was for something to do like it was always in the background yeah throughout all the military were you cutting boys in the barracks oh yeah just for the just for the crack like yeah yeah, we'd shave mohawks into our head and everything when I was um, out in Afghanistan and things like that. And what was the standard for military cuts? Were you allowed those sort of ridiculous things when you're on base? Depending on what unit you're with. Okay. Um, depending on what know. unit you're with, once again, like they'd have their particular rule set, but it was always to be neat and tidy. Um, and you go to different units and you can have the longer hair and be bearded. Um, and they were bearded, more... Bearded over in the Middle East is an advantage anyway yeah because you blend in more well well, you're, a, when lot, you're, a lot when of them see it as man. you're a man okay okay you know? so they'll have they'll they'll speak to you with a higher level of respect with a higher level of respect than, or, than you're close shaved interesting yeah because yeah okay and the other thing then as well is that you know, this is influenced from movies and, and mm-hmm. whatnot is that you often see special forces mm-hmm. will have the longer hair, the thicker beards. Yeah. And again, is there a logic behind that or is it that just because the unit they're in, it's, it's more permitted? It's a lot of big boys rules anyway. Okay. Um, you're not, your hand isn't held for you all the time, yeah. like, you know? So if you want to leave your hair grow, you can leave your hair mm. grow. If you want to cut it, you can cut it. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So all through it, you, you had the, the barber and you were doing cuts just for I say just for yeah. fun just for fun and then I came off a tour um, one Christmas I think it was Christmas time anyway and I went up to Dublin and I jumped into a barber shop on Dame Street um, called Sam's Barbers mm. I ended up in his chair and I was fairly bronze looking coming out <laughs> of the operations I was just on and I jumped into the chair and I had whatever was left of my mohawk at the time that was shaved into my head and he was asking who cut it and and I was like I did and then we just kind of traded our stories as such and what we'd been up to and I was like this is a fucking barber shop like um, and was he this, said to me was it similar to the Tom Winter style you had that you ended up with um, I've definitely talk, taken influence from um, barber shops like Sam and Sam himself and before I left, he just said, if you ever leave the military, you should consider this as a career. Like, this isn't just a, a hobby where mm. you can cut your hair. You make money and no this. one had ever said that to me. Nobody. True. And I've been cutting hair since I was 13 or whatever. And um, as soon as I took the one step out of the door, I was like, okay, this is a path. Whenever this military chapter of mm. my life ends, this is a path I should probably start looking at. And I did. Because you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, yeah. You enjoyed it, I, yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. i say it was something, again, that was individual. Yeah, okay. It's on me. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's I get on it. me, like, I'm, I, and I'm creating it. And you could be your own boss. You could run your could own be, shop. You, you could, could, well, I never even thought of it that yeah. in-depth okay. at the time. It was just something you enjoyed, something made enjoyed. money. I was like, yeah, and you're good. I at can it. get paid for this, and I can make this a career. And that's where that kind of cog started turning for me. And, when and I you... just wanted to absorb as much as I could, and I would go to different barber shops in whatever country I was in, and I would just sit in the queue, just watch, and just watch. I'm a visual learner anyway. Okay. And I'd be just Another watching them, and I'd be, I'd be annoying them, yeah. and I'd be 
ask them why they do that. What are you doing here? What are these things? Because at the time I didn't even know how to use a scissors. It was all just clipper work at the time. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of was a fully absorbed by it. And I would, was like, okay. And then I would go back to the me unit or whatever it is, mm-hmm. and I just try practicing things. Yeah, experimenting yeah, with, experiment it. with it. And <clears throat> were you going into barber shops over in in the Middle East? And no, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sitting there, with your, with your left, <laughs> yeah, like, right, boys. <laughs> no, definitely not. Okay, no. so when you're when you're going into experiment at the barber shops, it's all across all across Europe. Europe, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, and you're picking up the skills here. And, I'm just and, visually looking, yeah. yeah, and just absorbing it all in. Mm. Yeah. And when you came out of Sam's shop that day, mm-hmm. were you still in the military? Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. you went back to the military. Back to the military, yeah. And how... Back on training and operations again. And I worked my way up through different units and then I went down a, a medical side. Okay. Yeah. I remember you saying this to me, right? Yeah. That. So what was happening? Explain again what was happening with the fact that doctors weren't... The trained doctors coming in weren't ready for what they witnessed. Not necessarily doctors as such, um, but the the combat medic. Um, I said, the young men and women mm. who were joining, and we had a couple of incidents where medics froze on us mm. in the field. Yeah, on the ground, and when you freeze and you're frozen by fear, like people speak a lot about fear these days. I think. Fear is when you completely shut down and freeze. Everything else is you being scared or nervous or anxious. Mm. And it's all about controlling that energy of them. I don't necessarily... Like, fear is there, but it's only if you freeze up in it. Mm. If, like, and you, you're you helpless in it. That's what fear is. Mm. Um, so there's no, there's no fear as such for me. I've, I've never froze on the spot yet and, and so I prepare my mind for that you had medics that were freezing that were freezing unfortunately and it was just due to lack of training I think not necessarily on an academic side of things with combat medics but on the practical side I think the training at the time just wasn't what it needed to be to be put into these frontline situations where Men are getting blown up and losing limbs or shot in multiple in the face or in the chest and they have or whatever. To try it is. and do a repair you job there and there. Ju- yeah. Mm-hmm. So I knew. So I was seeing, and I was seeing the effects of medics who come back off tour as well, um, and they just weren't right. Whether it, that be of what they seen, or whether that be of something that. They should have done and they, they couldn't didn't. do it. Because that's the other thing then is that when that level of responsibility is on you, if you mm-hmm. bottle it, you have the combination of the fact that you know you bottled it, but mm-hmm. someone may have died as a result of your inactivity and that you ob- you may f- bear more responsibility. Mm-hmm. So you could think of it tough. like that. People will... Everyone knows everyone and should prepare their mind for for death like mm. you know especially when you're in a war zone oh, man, some people sp- aren't going to make it we spend you know? so much time avoiding that topic here yeah like, we, we do everything we can to pretend that death isn't coming no we it's, should embrace it oh man not maybe embrace it the wrong <laughs> word, but you should acknowledge it yeah. sorry and prepare as as best as you can for it and that's why we're so heavily trained in the military you know so you you were watching this I was watching yeah and you said right I can do something about this yeah at the time I was climbing up the ranks and I had, I had refused rank as well they, yeah they kept pushing you for promotions for, and I didn't I, I wanted to stay uh, in the trenches yeah. yeah I loved that I said I was in love with it at the time and th- this is when my attitude's slowly starting to change mm. and I'm growing up a bit as well at the same time and I'm developing myself Mm. and I was like I can offer I want to go down this medical side Mm -hmm. and be where I can react to my the men I'm serving with left and right of me if they get injured Mm -hmm. you know while also being part of the mission exactly being a core part of the mission yeah 
And so mm-hmm. how much training did they have to give you in order to... Like, first of all, were they resistant they to you? They spent. Were they like, no, Steve, you stay over and do your job here? Or were they like, all right, if you want to do it, let's go? Yeah. So <clears throat> the unit I was with then sent me forward to the medical corps to get the training that was a, needed to be a combat medic, which is a, a lot of trauma basic. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it just all started rolling and progressing from there. And learning the the academic side of, of yes. medicine yeah. didn't bother you this time. No, because I knew because it was something that it fascinated some, you. It's something I needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. whoever was injured needed. And this you know? is this is again just going back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of like the approach to school. Yeah, is that one of the things I found when I took the year out after school, went back to the PLC and then went into college. Yeah, was the difference was that while I was in college, mm-hmm. I was motivated to be there because I picked this course and this is something I was working towards. Mm-hmm. And I watched people who weren't motivated for their course fail. Yeah, and the difference because I wasn't, I hadn't increased in intelligence. I hadn't gotten yeah. a, a boost of IQ over the, the two years between the year out and the PLC. The difference was the motivation behind it. There you go. And the academic side wasn't a problem anymore. Yeah despite failing miserably in school yeah yeah so you you get the academic side of the medics yeah down yeah and they go right you're being deployed again yeah so at that stage then um yeah we deployed then yeah but i was still an integral part of the infantry at the time yeah i just had another skill set which was as a medic and again, this isn't important. I am just curious, though. So yeah. Is there extra money as a medic? No. 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 It's all the same. All the same. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this this was just another skill set to to add. And so yeah. how how On long the more then did you work as a medic? Um. Yeah. So it was from then I continued my career as a medic. Okay. Um. After that operation, then. Because the I whole con- I continued as a as more of a full time medic as such because your career the military career spans what about 12 years it depends how long you want to go in that's that's no I mean, no, no I mean you yourself oh personally. me I'm just shy of 10 years okay and yeah. would you have said it was the majority of that no I became six, a medic six years was infantry okay and the last and then couple the, were the last kind of three and a half four was solely on the medical side okay. of things yeah mm. and was was there a portion that you would have preferred to the other I, I love being just in there in there yeah whatever on the do. ground whatever yeah. it may be and then but with the medical side it gave me another direction mm-hmm. um and i had a lot of different opportunities then thrown at me through the medical side of things and mm-hmm. uh, where i helped train young combat medics and just just put a little bit more of that practical aspect to them to their academic knowledge you know and did they take it when you were in the classroom did the people you were training take you seriously when you gave the graphic description well i had a, i had a, i had a background of of battlefield experience and they did so they take you at your face value yeah when someone some some, some, some do yeah. yeah some don't do either look at you and say ah, he's exaggerating it's not yeah, that bad so, so some look you know you just don't click with particular people or whatever yeah. it is takes a bit of time to break those kind of shells down um did you have photographs from like graphic photographs from when you were there where you were like look this is this, this is exactly what you're going to be dealing with ah there's 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 loads of kind of photographs you can revert to i didn't have any personal ones okay i wasn't one of those ones there's probably pictures of me that other lads have yeah. on tours and stuff like that but i never brought the camera anyway okay. which sometimes i'm kind of a bit disappointed that i mm. didn't because there were so many um opportunities to capture some amazing things like, mm. you know but yeah because there is a lot of moments of beauty in these sort of areas like because you're, oh, you're yeah. in these incredible countries stunning really really beautiful mm-hmm. there's those quiet moments where you you can just decompress while you're out there for yeah. those very short periods and yeah well breathing is very mm. important like <laughs> you're just breathing and controlling yourself like mm. in these situations as well so you don't flap so what was the point then that you said, right, I need to move on from the military? I got to exactly where I wanted to go. And it wasn't what I expected. And it wasn't what I expected um, because I was in a really strange state of mind at the time, in a bit of a toxic relationship with someone as well. Um, 
and I wasn't putting my all to it. I didn't have the same drive and determination um, and discipline as I did throughout my mm. earlier career. So I got to where I wanted to go and just went lax. I was like, yeah, cool. And here I am. And it wasn't what I expected. I was like, fuck. Can you give a little bit more detail about where you wanted to go? What that was? What that looked like? I just wanted to um, be with... A particular the, unit? The, the tip of the spear. Okay. And you got there? And, I got there. And it wasn't what you were... It wasn't... Your fantasies had sort of played yes, it up a little bit more. of course. Of course they did. But it was extremely integral parts of the job like um when it comes to counter-terrorism and things like that working in particular countries mm. uh, but i wasn't there i wasn't i was kind of torn between multiple parts of myself and as i said in a bit of a toxic relationship which wasn't going too well at the time um and interesting relationships then with close friends i had do you know um yeah but all a learning experience mm. All something I've definitely gained from. And but it was yeah, sorry, yeah. No, go ahead. But it was it was great to get there and to see it and to operate um with these particular units like. And so did you feel then that there was a not only had the motivation dropped to a certain degree, did you then feel that that would have resulted in a potential increase in, in your risk to your health and the people around you because you weren't operating at your max 100 percent, 100 percent. i was way too cool about things yeah your edge had been rubbed off yeah i was like i was so relaxed that if anyone had that's that's when you die yeah yeah that's that's so relaxed about here and about particular casualties or whatever it was i was like okay and i was like there was no shock that, factor anymore the, not necessarily that shock factor but that it's that kind of fire in your belly like okay. um i wasn't i don't know that at, through this period um politically things had changed and things had changed within soldier and as well because now the front, on the front line like you know now we're sort of 2011 2012 um, even later small. even later yeah. 2014 15 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 15 I'd say and so how long how long were you wrestling with the idea that you realised you were going to possibly leave yeah um, quite a long time quite a long time I got I got where I wanted to go and I was like done and as soon as that box was ticked you began that was it yeah that was it yeah and I was like my mind was scattered absolutely scattered and so when it comes to leaving the military, what's the procedure? Um, yeah, you've got to go and go through the process of leaving. You just and go you, to your you, commanding you, officer. I, I, you... I still have, no, 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 you go up to the, to the, the systems that are needed. Like, um, It's like an application you, you, to leave. Yeah, sort pretty of thing. much. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like another contract assigned to leave. Okay. And I'm glad I did. But when sometimes when I look back, only sometimes I'm like, I wish I put more. I wish I had that. I wish I put more of a drive and an effort into where I was. Mm. Yeah. But the fact yeah. is that it's easy to say that now when it you're is. rested it and is. you're years from it, and you say I could have yeah. done more. But at the the fact is that at the time you you couldn't. I couldn't. No. There wasn't that other year anymore. No. There wasn't. Um. And but I then. Like throughout this time, I'm still thinking of this future exit plan. And what is Barbara? And so at that point, while you're still in the military, you're like I can do Barbara. You you you'd met yeah. Sam years ago. That years thought ago. had been in your years head years ago. Yeah, and I was creating it. You and then and then at the time, then you were having like YouTube and these different kind of people on Instagram and stuff that were coming up. I was like ah. Yeah, and it just started kind of progressing and growing from there. I said I didn't know any barbers at the time. Mm. Um, kind of hard when you're moving from exactly, place to place. Exactly. However, I was watching from a distance, mm. and I was learning as much as I could on the move. Like, and yeah. so when you were leaving, were you leaving the British forces? Were you leaving Australia? Or like, how did it work? Because of the fact that you kind of moved around a bit. Yeah, I moved around a bit. So like, I would have served with 
uh, on joint operations with multiple nations around the world, like um, whether it be Dutch or French or and who did American you, or who whoever. Who did you sign out with? I signed <laughs> out with um, a particular unit in the UK. Okay. Yeah. And so then, did you move back to Cork straight away? No. Where did you say? I up? went back to Australia. Huh. Yeah. yeah. I went back to Australia back for to where it all began. Kind of. I did, yeah. I never actually thought of it like that way, but I kind of psychologically went back there. Like subconsciously retracing your steps almost. Mm, possibly, yeah. Something in when you I think drew of it you like back that. there, yeah. Yeah, I went back and I was looking. I was like, will I do this again? Will I set up here? Mm. Where's the drive? But at the time, like, as I said, when I left at Ireland at 17, there was a hatred. I, I had this dark kind of hatred for Ireland. And everything that had put me through mm. was quite selfish. Mm. Um, but over the years, and as years went on, I'm just magnetized back to Ireland. And I just fell in love with it. And I was That's like, nice. and I, I, it was the second I touched down in Australia, again. You were like, I want to go back to Ireland. I was like, it's Ireland. What? It's Ireland. I've got to get home. Yeah. So how long did you even spend in Australia? I think I only lasted seven weeks. And again, doing what? Living. Cruising around, I was looking at different locations. You had a bit meeting, of money from the military. Meeting, yeah, yeah, yeah. Meeting different barbers. Um, did a couple of courses over there. Mm -hmm. And then... Did you do a couple of courses? A couple of courses, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was bouncing around doing hairdressing and barbering courses around Europe as well. Mm -hmm. And um, just because I was like, ah, oh, sure, I'll just be a barber. And I was like, well, how am I going to do this? Hmm. Um, I only have the experience of messing around and cutting <laughs> hair and trying to learn as much as I could from... i cut a sick visual, mohawk, though. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I had to go through all these courses because I needed to get the, the qualifications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Glenn, do you ever get your qualifications? I don't think you do. <laughs> Glenn, get your qualifications. <laughs> I needed to get all my qualifications together um, and get all the ticks in the box, which I was quite used to mm. getting those kind of ticks in the box on a military side of things mm -hmm. when I was specialising within particular roles so I knew what had to be done and so then you said you, you came back to Ireland then yeah back to Cork yeah back Did, home back home yeah and at that stage what was the relationship like with your father and your family oh so much better because like, when you rang after the basic training like it I did it yeah. Was there like, oh, was there a new... Oh, yeah, there was a, oh, yeah. completely, that was it. Yeah. It was water under the bridge then. Wow. And I handed over, I got like a, what the fuck did I get, a cup or a trophy or something for best soldier. And I just handed it to him and I was like, and all I said was two weeks and we just had a hug and that was it, it was done. And the race, my relationship with my parents has been great ever since and the rest of my family members like. Of course, you come to loggerheads every now and again, but you know, yeah, it's been brilliant. You're the best best soldier in training. Yeah, in training, yeah. And did you get any awards throughout your career? Yeah, I got a few. And are they actual physical medals, or how how do awards look like in the military? Yeah, some of the operations. Yeah, you, like, well, look, you get your medals for operations or. But coins. some of the secret ones are like, look, you did a great oh, job, yeah. but no one can ever speak about these days again. Yeah, it's not even a pat on the back. Mm. You don't need it though. No, yeah. You don't need yeah, it. Yeah, I get that. I don't need none of it. I don't even know where any of them are. <laughs> so they're probably collecting dust somewhere. Serious? And I don't and I don't care. Yeah. Do not care. That doesn't matter like to me. You should put them on none display the, in the barbershop. No, man. I wouldn't no. Why? Because like I've even pictures of me cutting hair in in a barracks or in out on tour in Africa or wherever I be. Or Afghanistan. Mm. And I'd like to put them up, but I'm like, nah. What's holding you back? Nah. There's nothing holding me back. That's the past, like. That's the past. It's good to look at the past and acknowledge it and appreciate how far you've came, but I can't stay in there. If you stay in there, then you can't move forward. And you think by putting them on display and looking at them every day, it's going to yeah, hold just, you back? Yeah, it just holds my mind there. I don't want that. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Like, as I say, it's great to look back and be like, and like, people should look back but to the past right and just acknowledge it how far they've came or whatever it may be and the struggles that they've came through and just appreciate it but don't get stuck there mm. like and there's a lot of ex-soldiers who get stuck there and they keep mm. talking the same old fucking war story 
or whatever it is, mm. spinning some shit dits or whatever, you know, and I'm just like, let it go, let it go, let it acknowledge it, appreciate it, whatever happened, you've learned from, push forward. Um, all throughout your career, were your family and extended family looking at you with disgust, no, respect, not at all. or because particularly no. I mentioned this one to you before about yeah. looking at the UK. Yeah. There's still so much stupidity in Ireland that's oh, why are you going fighting with them? Oh, shut your mouth. Like, get over it. Let it's, bygones it's, be it's, bygones. It's a lack of knowledge. It is a lack It's, it's a lack just of raw knowledge. ignorance, right? And it's, um, it's a terrible... It's the, we have such a depth of history <clears throat> in Ireland of... Irish men and women going, going and serving with multiple units around the world and the contributes that we've made to different like World War One mm. and World War Two and we're all volunteers. Mm. Like Irish men and women were volunteers for a lot of the wars that have are in the past and we will be in a lot of wars in the future, in the future as volunteers. It's never really celebrated in Ireland. It's though. never There's such only a recently. strange mentality in Ireland where there's a oh, why are you going doing that yeah. sort of approach to it yeah which is a weird one mm-hmm. it certainly is yeah yeah I don't know but you didn't find any problems your, your, your family while you were serving didn't ever look at you sideways or be like no oh, god if they did like you didn't me extended family maybe I don't give a fuck if, <laughs> yeah. if they did or not yeah if they did or not the only the only family that matters to me is my initial mm-hmm. circle, like and the boys my mum, my dad, and my sisters, with. like yeah, yeah, that's it. How many? I don't how many shit family? what anyone thinks. I've got three other sisters. All sisters. All sisters. No and just the a new. I have a, a beautiful nephew now as well, and he's over in Australia. So I'll be back to Australia soon enough again. Ah, uh, very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Because your sister's in Australia, is she? Your sister's been in Australia for like 10, 12 years now or something like that. And did she go out there post-2008, was it? Was she one of the Irish yeah. that went yeah. out there? Yeah, she okay. was, yeah. And she settled down over there? Yeah, she's a nurse over there, nurse. yeah. Mm-hmm. And where did the Are you the youngest or where did I'm you the oldest. You're the oldest. I'm okay. the oldest, yeah, so I made a lot of mistakes. Well, you Which I hope they the, learn from. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times that's the job of the older siblings is to screw up enough so that the younger ones don't. Mm-hmm. Or... What actually happens is that the younger ones learn how to avoid getting caught. That's very true. And like I have this problem with my brother a lot where he got it in the neck yeah. for the whole years. And my parents probably look at me and so probably assume that, oh, well, he didn't get up to the same mischief that the mm-hmm. older brother did. But you did. But I did. I just <laughs> knew how to avoid getting caught. That's it. That was the difference That's between it. us. Yeah. And so the other two sisters then, where are they? They've just returned home just due to the COVID. Okay. You know? Oh, because we're all three of them in Australia? No, no. One was over in South America and the okay. other was over between France and the UK. So you all had that spirit of Oh, God, flight. yeah. Yeah. Where we did all, that we come all from left there? very young. Did your mother or father, when they were yeah, younger? They, they, they would have travelled a lot when they were younger. So like, it's in the blood, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. And so you came back to Ireland, to the family home. You said, right... My next prerogative, I'm setting up a barbershop in Cork. Yeah, this is me. I had <clears throat> I had a goal in mind, and I don't even like saying goals. I, I like I prefer using it as stepping stones to a purpose. Uh-huh. Not a goal like uh-huh. or goals to a purpose. Yeah. But there has to be purpose and the reasons why, like what's your reason why and and how are you going to do it? I, I like solving that. And I say, put myself in that uncomfortable position. I was like, okay. And so what was your reason why? What, what was your... Um, what was the word you said there? Not goal, but... Um, purpose? Purpose. My purpose was... So, like, I struggled leaving the military. Mm-hmm. And coming out and trying to reintegrate into the civilian aspect. Of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that wasn't easy. Um, just because of... Many men don't survive it. No, it is, it is, and it, it's not easy. And it's sad for someone to survive war for however number of years mm. and then to, to eventually end their life one way or another Yeah. when when they come back to peace. Yeah, there's a lot of men I know who have, mm. who have unfortunately done, gone down that road. Mm. And there's a lot of men that I know at the moment who are um, in, we'll say, the rehabilitation phases mm. of, of 
because I had um, nah. my first real encounter with sort of genuine untreated PTSD was with a there was a homeless fella appeared would have been not last summer or summer before yeah and uh, well he wasn't homeless at the beginning mm-hmm. he was a fella who kicked off in one of the one of the clubs and got barred it happened in another pub and very quickly because the security company I work for had most of the doors in, in Cork yeah we have a security chat and effectively other than one or two places Cork is effectively tied up in this one chat yeah and this fella went into the chat like his, his details were sent in the chat like look this, this, this fella's trouble and so mm-hmm. within two weeks he was barred from every place in Cork yeah but he was a stacked strong individual and we began to wonder because he appeared the second weekend so like there was a Friday night he kicked off in a place was barred the Saturday night kicked out another place barred again and very good when that happened right we all mm. know that this fella's around and he's a problem yeah and I would have met him that that weekend the night after him getting kicked out the time before I met him on the on one of the doors and alright Foxy and automatically a, quite aggressive and, and snarly and yeah the usual sort of drunk person but what was strange was the following weekend he was in the same clothes mm-hmm. and so then we were like is this fella homeless or not and the week yeah. after he was around again and then he was appearing during the day so again Cork Safe the company the, the app that's connected to my company will have day patrol all around Cork and he began to cause problems in centres and, and spars and be on the streets hanging out with the junkies and getting yeah. arrested and getting done for, for shoplifting and he just became a regular face of yeah. problems mm-hmm. and the first few encounters I had him were negative hyper aggressive balling for a fight but he didn't fit the criteria of the oh. usual people I deal with mm-hmm. on the streets and I remember so and then but the thing is for me is I don't respond emotionally yeah. at all I, mm-hmm. I, it's, it's just always and this is why the job is actually quite suits me and, and why I'm able for a lot maybe a lot more stress than, than other people is that my emotions are separated from what needs to be done yeah. and so whatever he wanted to say to me didn't phase me and I deal with him and bit of push and shove and maybe one weekend wouldn't bother me the following weekend if I mm-hmm. saw him again I'd still speak to him normally yeah. and I wouldn't be I wouldn't be still operating at that emotional I, level yes. from the week before I fully get you yeah. and so then one day I was, I was chatting to him and once I kept up this facade I was one of the few bouncers that he actually talked to civilly and mm-hmm. properly yeah. and he'd, he'd wander up he to my door him. he respected me and mm-hmm. I respected him yeah. and he'd wander up to my door some nights not even try to get in and sit down in a chair beside me and watch people go up and down and making rude comments to girls and stuff and I'd be like man mm. shut up like come yeah. on you can't be, I'm standing beside yeah. you you can't be making these comments standing beside me yeah ah yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and what are you at Foxy and why are you down here because we would have chatted him from Tipperary and that would have been over and back and yeah he lives nearby and eventually I got to a point where I was able to ask him man what are you doing like yeah how are you on the streets because what was happening is week by week he'd be coming in with more black eyes more cuts more bruises mm. the nose was getting more mangled and he was missing teeth and scars on his hands and like some weeks he'd be still fresh blood would be running out of his face and I'm like man yeah. what happened ah yeah and yeah. most of the answer I get and there's a few different stories about why this the beatings he was getting but we won't go into them now mm-hmm. but I remember saying to him man like what are you doing like you were obviously not homeless yeah. originally. You were well muscular at the start of this summer. You were you you were able to speak. You're not an alcoholic. You're mm-hmm. now using a lot of alcohol and a lot of drugs, but you're not an alcoholic. And yeah. where did this come from? And it turns out that he actually served in Israeli special forces yeah. for seven years. And I went, okay. Yeah. Things are beginning to make a little bit more sense now. Definitely. And as the weekends would wear on the conversations would, would keep coming he'd talk more about what went on and one of the times I was like man wh- why do you not try to get help like what, what, like you know you know the approach you're taking here isn't going to do you any favours and he goes look when you've butchered women and children you can't talk to any counsellor and tell them on a level that they're going to connect with yeah <sighs> And I under I I get what he means by that. I just had to like yeah, fair enough. Like okay. I, I can't. There's nothing more I can say to that. Like because mm-hmm. this is your demons that you're dealing with, and particularly in Ireland, the facilities aren't there. 
the extreme yeah. trauma PTSD suffering individuals they don't have those well, according to him and from what little bit of research I did yeah. it isn't really there and no. we even see on, on more on, on, on um, more subtly with, within the guards and within paramedics and stuff where yeah. particularly with the guards there's a huge problem with alcoholism mm -hmm. and I remember asking one of my lecturers I was like what's the story why, why are so many guards alcoholics subtly and he goes there's only so many times you can see a dead body that's it I said whoa okay fair enough and there's no help provided for them either. Yeah. Now there, there's there's mandatory uh, counselling sessions they have to attend after tr very traumatic incidents, mm -hmm. like after the Alan Hall murder, um, murder suicide. I know all the guards and paramedics present there receive weeks and weeks of, of, of mm -hmm. counselling. But there seems to me, like you spotted with the gap in the medics' qualifications, I see a gap in the healthcare. Yeah, for these sort of real specific trauma. Um, now, eventually going back to this fella, I think he moved back in with his mother for a while, and then ended up back in the streets, and then he went missing for a couple of weeks, and we thought he'd been killed, and uh, then we found out he'd been locked up after going on a rampage up in Dublin, and, and putting guard, knocking guards out, and yeah. strapping his belt around his hand, and taking his scissors in the other hand, and going on a mad one, and. Then he came back after being let out and I was chatting to him about that and what he got up to. It's a dark hole. It was it really was a dark hole. Yeah. And I haven't seen him in a in a good while again. Mm. And I just hope that things improve for him. Mm -hmm. He's know. want to, he's he's got to want to that that improvement for himself as well though. He does. You can bring that horse water exactly. and all that. Exactly. Um, but he is an example of someone who came out of military life and didn't mm -hmm. acclimatize. Yeah. So why do you think you have and others didn't? I think I took like the core values as such an ethos from the military and I slowly brought it into because in the military you're in a bubble, right? Mm -hmm. You're in this bubble, it's your own world like out this outside bit doesn't matter the fuck but when you step into it I was slowly bringing them values into my civilian aspect of life like like I, I was really struggling when I initially left <clears throat> excuse me um, because I wasn't around all the lads mm. I, I, I felt like I had nothing to wake up to mm. Uh, I didn't have that structure yeah that yeah. purpose was gone like now this is when I initially left before I started really getting the the cogs turning or the wheels moving as such with the bear burn aspect of things mm. I just I felt empty for quite some time and then you've got the choice everyone has a choice I can fall into a bottle here and drugs which wasn't me and I've I've dabbled with alcohol a lot in the military like it's a it's a it's a way of venting in the mm. military also, almost like um but, but you didn't turn I didn't, it to a no, crutch afterwards no you can't use and was that like, a conscious if, decision if you if you over, like if you're overusing something and that becomes a crutch as you say it's very difficult when you're leaning all your weight on that like yeah. how do you get rid of that it's a slow long process like was it a conscious decision not to fall down that path? Yeah. Like you felt the urge, you felt some days, fuck, I'd love to just sit down and drink the bottle of whiskey. Yeah. Just let the madness out. And you had to actively like, like, no. Mm. And the, like, did you go running? Did you, what yeah, did you I, do to distract yourself? <clears throat> I had to get back into that. I had to get back into physical training because I just kind of let it all go. Understandably. Um, like an extended it, decompression period. Yeah. Just let myself kind of go quite a lot. So I had to get back into that. And I had to kind of reconnect with um, with nature as well. So I spend a lot of my time up in the mountains, in the hills, in the forests, loads of kayaking, swimming, scuba diving, whatever I can do out in nature. I'm quite happy. Did you ever have a problem with night terrors or anything when you nothing. went back home? Nothing. Like your trauma didn't come back to the family? No, home. I accepted everything. Like I accepted whatever I did, I accepted truthfully and you, truthfully accepted everything would you attribute why, a lot of mm. your peace to that acceptance yeah that's that, what and that some fellas who are constantly plagued by their traumas because they haven't yet 
come to that point in their head where they're at peace with it. Yeah, that they they need to maybe they need to break it down to its most simplest form. Like, mm. uh, I'm quite an analyst. Like, mm. um, um, a lot of my family members and my girlfriend would say that I analyze things quite a bit. I analyzed even before I jumped on this podcast with you, mm. where we met briefly beforehand to have a chat. You know, mm. and um, that's how I have to go about things and break it down into its simplest form. And what are you looking for in those moments? Or is it a gut instinct? It's I, I work a, a lot off my gut. Mm. Yeah, I really do. I listen to it. I listen to myself, listen to my body, mm. you know? And a lot of people need to learn that skill because you actually will find that mm-hmm. if you trust your body, your body will tell you what you need. It will. It really will. And mm-hmm. like I, I always say it with people, a really good example is uh, if you get used to drinking two liters of water or more every day, yeah, and you do that for say ten days to two weeks. The day that you don't keep up that habit, you will feel headachy, you feel groggy, you feel slow, you feel aggressive. Yeah, and it you will be directly because your body has gotten used to operating on this optimal level of yeah. water function, and you will suffer within yeah. a, within a couple of hours. <clears throat> you'll suffer if you're not hitting your your daily water requirements, and that's a real easy one. That's easy. That's what so it is. It's the simple it's things the, you need to get. Yes, and but it's, it's and they will lead to the bigger. The principle there is yeah. that your body is telling you what mm-hmm. it needs. Yeah. Because your body has a computer, mm-hmm. which is a perfect calculated. Mm-hmm. All the data in your body is running through this this control panel, and if you just allow it to tell you what it needs, mm-hmm. it will tell you. Yeah. And people don't listen to that inner voice. They're mm-hmm. I don't know why. I yeah. don't know why. whether they can't hear it they don't want to listen but they don't so there, there is sometimes like true testing periods or selection periods in the military and stuff um, you've got to let the mind take complete control like so your body will get you to a certain point but sometimes you do have to push through hmm. that and that's when you really find out who you are when you push through that barrier of oh this hurts or whatever mm. it may be I can't do this anymore and the the doubt and negative thinking starts coming in and that you need to shut that bit down and stay focused on what you're doing and and overpower it with this mm. yeah because the other thing as well about doing all the, the drilling is that yeah. you allow in this muscle memory and that you oh. remove the conscious part of your mind yes. where the doubt and, and fear begins yeah. to really take its hold mm-hmm. and it's automatic it's all automatic responses That's, that is exactly how i tried my best and su- hopefully succeeded uh, with a lot of medics i was training especially when it came to kind of catastrophic bleeds mm. i wanted that and we would we would practically go through it time and time again mm. and, until I had it as close to muscle memory as possible. Mm. I was like, I do not want your conscious thought and your and you visually taking everything in in these moments, these critical moments where mm. there's a catastrophic bleed happening or like an arterial bleed. You need to go in there and stop this bleed immediately. Mm. Then take a breath, reassess and carry on with whatever treatment is needed or whatever the mission, whatever's needed in the mission. Like, mm. um, So I would try my best to get the initial basics of battlefield trauma down to muscle memory. Yeah. And we would repetition just constantly. And they'd be sick of me. And I know they'd be hating me at the time, but I do hope that, yeah, it stands to them at some point now. Like even on a more mundane level, Mm -hmm. like one of the first real places I began to really see the benefits of it is like in your, when you're sparring, if you're going for a takedown. Yeah. If you, because like you can snap a jab on muscle memory yeah. when the opportunity is there bang the space is there whatever but there's a little bit more of a psychological thing when it comes to takedowns because you're, you're throwing your head and your vulnerable parts of yes. your body down into dangerous territory yeah. and your body will fight you it will say no 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 we're not going down there that's dangerous down there and it was one of the lads or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 but <clears throat> so as soon as you think about it without knowing it a trained fighter will be able to read you, you mm-hmm. a trained fighter will know he's about to shoot for the takedown mm-hmm. And one of the first places where, where I was on the mats and the fellow was sparring it was like, stop thinking. If you're t- going for the takedown, as soon as you think I'm going to go for a takedown, you've lost. Yeah. Just boom, go for it. Automatic. And the next thing, when, when you actually, it, and it's difficult Let to them. push yourself into that framework where it's an automatic thing. Yeah. I was landing takedown, 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 takedown. Just in that flow. And within two minutes before that, mm-hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't get anywhere near him. Yeah. 
And then boom, as soon as it was just an automatic response, Brilliant. he couldn't yeah. defend it at all. Mm-hmm. It was takedown after takedown. And that's where you can really see, again, like the water example, the takedown yeah. was just an automatic response that you can see what the importance of muscle memory. Yes, definitely. And the other thing then as well, coming back to when you were initially coming out, was so like you had a... you. So first of all, I think that your personality made you particularly, made you acutely suited to the roles that you were in. Mm-hmm. And that's something that you had an, a, a, an advantage over other individuals because genetics were in your favor. You had you won the cortical lottery, as it's called. Okay. And so you would have been quite suited that way already. <clears throat> so that when you trained your mind consciously to to have a sense of purpose or to mm-hmm. to now right I'm now going to reincorporate my military techniques to my ordinary life yes. in order to give me that drive and that that all suited you wonderfully but it also ties in a lot with things like Viktor Frankl would have said when he was um, when he wrote uh, Man's Search for Meaning was uh, mm-hmm. he who has a he who has a why can bear almost any how yeah and there's a there's a massive aspect of having a sense of purpose that sustains you through very difficult periods. Yes, mm-hmm. and you would have put it, and it seems too too simple to say, right? It's going to be a barber shop now. That's your sense of purpose because it's that's not enough. No. So there was something deeper running inside you. Yeah. That you were aiming for. I wanted it. I, like, I can talk. We could do a whole other podcast on the shop. Definitely. But I wanted it somewhere for me. <clears throat> I thought of it when I was thinking in my head. I wasn't thinking about the customer whatsoever or the man who was coming in. I didn't particularly care about what kind of man was coming in the door. I, I, I did it all for me. I, I was selfish in that aspect where I was like, how do I want to shop? How do mm-hmm. I want to be sitting? What do I want to be looking at? Every, everything. How, what environment do I do I as an individual want to be in? Mm. That's how I went through my entire process. I never thought of the man who was coming in the door. Mm. No, and so that's quite selfish. But as a result, what happens is it creates genuine customers. Because when someone likes a shop, they're not just liking the shop; they're liking your idea of what your ideal life, uh, what your ideal image looked like. Yeah. And again, like meeting an Irish man in the middle of Lebanon or in the middle of of. Uh, of uh, Tel- uh, Helmond you have an automatic commonality with someone who's just walked into your That's shop it. and gone this is savage I, I, I want to yeah. come here for my haircuts because mm-hmm. I want to live I want to I want to be in a shop like this yes now they have stepped into yeah, your like imagination mm-hmm. and they said I like it here yeah and boom you've actually had deeper connection with this person than someone who said right what does a customer want in a shop and Say, yeah. for argument's sake, going out doing a survey about what people want in their barbershop. They're yeah. trying to run to all these other people's agendas no, yeah. and creating something that they don't really feel comfortable in. That's it. But they think other customers like it and it might be good for business. Yeah. Again, you've done the opposite. I've done the opposite. And it's I benefited never, you. Oh, I'm, I'm blown away. I'm blown away. Like, I used to visualize when I was, because I built a lot of it by hand myself and using nice. a lot of my friends. Yeah. Um, and it took me a long time me a long time to build it but I could see it all come together and every single day I was in there I was literally visualising what it's going to look like mm. what the finished product is the customers are going to have the the music that's playing mm. the the way the light's coming in the window I want I was visualising queues of men going over the square waiting to get into the shop and that happened and I had virtual queues six months in advance booked up solid so it, it it did come true in the music everything i was doing there was purpose in every single day and everything i was doing even if i was only there to brush the floor it was a like it mm. was a stepping stone sorry to my purpose mm. which is to be in there and like i don't think my purpose is cutting hair as mm. such but it's it's definitely in that kind of male environment and having that brotherhood again as such, mm. you know? But you see, you don't just cut hair, you provide an experience. That's it. So people come into your shop, not because they, they need a haircut, but because they're, they're stepping into this era mm-hmm. that's, first of all, very rare in today's world. But it's, it's, it's rare because the motivations that are pumped into it you see you you have 
it's strange but you have an effect on the environment that you create mm -hmm. that there's an aura that people can feel a tangible vibe that's there and if it's and this is an airy fairy now but if it's if it's constructed with the right motivations it can create a very unique and powerful sort of aura yeah and agree. your shop has that because mm -hmm. you've been genuine in what you put into it yeah like even the whole concept of, of building a lot of it with your hands when people hear you talk about the shop there's a level of pride in your voice that an ordinary person wouldn't be able to conjure mm -hmm. and you're not even conscious in it, and you're not even consciously conjuring it it's no. there it's there yeah yeah and thank you that creates an energy as well that's mm -hmm. very unique um but can you see yourself there long term i think the shop will be there long after i'm gone and can in you some form it will be there can you see yourself running it to that point um I was saying, and, and how I'm, in, in this particular lockdown, the third lockdown now, how I'm mentally dealing with it, um, is I will be cut in hair in some form until I can't stand or my hands don't work anymore. I will be. Okay. I will be cutting hair in some form, whether it's one day a week, whether it's part-time. In court. What, in, wherever I may be. Mm. Wherever I may be. I, I, don't, I don't like to plan 10, 20 mm. years in advance. I might not get out of the, get back into the city today. Mm. You know, God knows what can happen. Um, like, so when you don't have these sort of longer term plans, how does that work when you're in a relationship? Um, it's kind of like a determination to like succeed together in whatever you do, like. Whatever, put, whatever you put your heart to, and your mind to. And she, like, how, first of all, because, like, a lot of people struggle to keep relationships when they come out of very stressful jobs because you can't really talk about everything with the other mm -hmm. person and they're never going to be fully able to understand. Yeah. So, first of all, you need a very patient partner. Well, certainly, You yeah. need a very loving and, and caring partner mm -hmm. because they have to be able to allow you to have moods that they can never understand. Yes. Um, and so, it, it, it can demand a lot of, of the people that, that get into relationships post these sort of services these careers but then to also add it to the fact that the personality aspect is that you're quite a free person and you're quite happy to let life unfold as it may yeah. and wherever the wind takes you you're going to go yeah right whatever today we're going to wake up and we're going to go jumping off the cliffs of Moher yeah. and that's just what the day <laughs> is going to look about, like don't know about the cliffs of Moher but yeah uh, you'll do it one day <laughs> no doubt or your abseil off or it's oh, something I'd like that <laughs> I'd like that but, a lot. So she obviously shares some yeah. of those traits. One hundred, yeah. Which I think both of us were surprising each other, which is great, isn't it? Because it when is great. That. It is great. Yeah, when you get that, and you find that. Because did she maybe think that she was going to struggle to find a partner with those traits? Possibly. And so, how is the relationship? It's really good. Really good. Um, we're in a good place, both of us, challenging each other. Mm. Um, as well as being in challenging times as of now like you know is she as much of an adrenaline junkie as you are um, maybe not in the particular aspects I'm in like I'm yeah. willing and hopefully going to be going through all my piloting for paragliding around the Alps and stuff this year <laughs> hopefully and I'm trying, going to then try and get into a bit of speed flying and come back to Ireland and go straight off the top of Karen Tool if I can <laughs> Um, that's I say that, that these are little things that I use for kicks, like mm. to replace the kicks you got the out of kicks. the Yeah, yeah. Mm. But um, no, the relationship's really good, and it's been testing at times, as every single relationship is, and uh, especially in this time, mm. as I was saying, you know. Um, but we accept each other. Good. Yeah. And I always wondered then. Would you ever consider like volunteering with like mountain rescue or these sort of units mm. because they they need people like you with yeah. the real experience mm -hmm. and there's again you'll you'll get that little again you get another kick but it'd be kick more in line with the sort of experiences you would have had in the past yeah because you're again you're dealing with helicopters you're dealing with very difficult conditions you're dealing mm -hmm. with traumatic injury you're dealing with with extreme stress and emotions have you ever considered a hundred percent i I'd love to um, I've even spoke about and spoke with particular units in Cork about um, 
counter-terrorist planning and um, trying to help. I've put myself down on the list to help within hospitals or mm. with, help with paramedics if I can. Um, on also a training aspect as well as not just dealing with the current situation that we're in. Uh, just because I've been experiencing different areas within mm. the medical field, like you know. And where so, did you go to try and put your name to the hat for that? Ah, I've particular Contacts. individuals who come into the shop as well who yeah. are winning uh, high roles up in these organisations. And do they take you seriously when you offer this advice? I would like to think they do. Mm. I take them seriously when they are speaking about their careers or whatever mm. it is. So I would like to think they do, yeah. Mm. But nothing's happened with it so far. No, we're a bit, Ireland's a little bit slow on particular things and a little bit a back step to, to different nations when it comes to... Well, this is what happened things. with Dara as well when he came back from mm. America. With all, and he's got extreme knowledge, particularly yeah. in policing. Yeah. And Big Harris told him, we, we don't care about that. We don't. Just, there's nothing we can do with you. I know. It's like, are you taking the piss? Yeah. Seriously. I, I've been fortunate enough to speak to people who are up in certain positions in Munster. And... I've just offered. I've just put it out yeah. there. Um, you I'm never like, know. This, this is my background. This is my history in these areas. I don't. I say I don't go into massive detail. But if they want to go a little bit more, talk a bit more in depth, then it's yeah, let's on. sit down and let's let's speak. Mm. Yeah. So in the next. So first of all, how like it's been difficult, obviously, without the shop being open. Yes. So the next couple of years, nothing set in concrete. You'll go do this course. You'll you'll just continue as you've been. I'll really. continue as I've been. I'm I'm really happy. Um, even though it's through this times lost massively financially. Uh, for myself, the shop and the, my staff, like um, are you still paying rent? Huge, there? huge loss. I've just got that frozen, but all of last year was paying rent on four four months takings. Um, however, I worked for the last three years. I've been working twelve to. 10 to 14 hour days every day and um, was on the brink of burning myself out but I'm very fortunate that I have because it's put me in a, in a position financially to continue paying rent um, you see you're smart with your money and because you never had that, that desire to spend 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 yeah. when the money came no. in you didn't need to have it gone as fast as it came in and so yeah. as a result it's benefited you it has benefited yeah mm. definitely um, yeah so I've Financially, it's been difficult the COVID, but I've gained so much in in myself, mm. um, and I've really understood my time management mm. properly. Like it is something you, you work extremely difficult on um, in the military, your time management and all of that. Um, without going too deep into that side of things, but I, I really kind of lacked it over the last couple of years, which is some say is understandable uh, when you're opening. A business you mm. need to get past that kind of two and a half year mark mm -hmm. uh, and you put everything you can into that which I did um, but yeah the, this these lockdowns have really helped me and I've grown massively Good. as an individual due to it and as I was as I was saying earlier like am I annoyed that I'm not in the shop right now and cutting hair I'm a little bit frustrated however as I'm gonna be cutting hair till I'm 70 I am so these the last year or so is realistically in the grand scheme of things it's only a weekend mm. of my time you know that's, maybe that's maybe maybe it's at. a night out of my time yeah it's a night out that's all it is embrace this time learn more about yourself and understand your circle and the people that you share your energy mm. and the people you let into your environment um so it's been great for me really has and I'm most certainly going to um, keep up the habits I have made through this period mm. of time like and when we get back to cutting hair we'll get back I'm going to have you back as well because I'd like to go to like there's the, a podcast on fashion and oh design yeah and brilliant kind of yeah. Thing, cause there's, I, could, I could keep going for another couple of mm. hours but I know yeah we're probably better coming at it fresher again yeah, but again. what I have you because that's my camera just after dying two seconds okay. let me just put the Fuck, we must be going some time, are we? <laughs> Brilliant, man. We'll, we'll pretty much wrap it up. Yeah. But while I actually have it, because I am curious now that I've locked down hair. Yeah. I've had I've had one haircut mm -hmm. in 11 months. Brilliant. 
Good on you. I had one. <laughs> uh, I had one in between lockdown uh, two and three. Yeah. What would you if I sat down in in, in your in your chair now? What would you do with that hair? Like? There's a lot you can do with it. Um, with us on your very first time visiting the shop, I'll go through a full con. Any any chair you jump in, you will be going through a full consultation <laughs> for about like. Five minutes would be a short consultation of your hair. That would be like, we go through everything. Yeah. The shape of your head, the texture of your hair, what you wear, how you present yourself, what your job is, what you activities you like to do. We take everything into account for a cut that would suit you. You know, so I could tell you right now, just shave the head. <laughs> <laughs> because it's probably looking like, fuck the end of May by the time we get yeah. back or grow it out. Um, I have a weird head though. I've got one of those big crowns. Those, I get you. The boys, when I used to have longer hair when I was younger, you, the boys used to say, oh, geez, we could pour the milk and the cereal into the bowl and sit <laughs> on the back of your head. I'd have to get you head. in the chair. I'd have I look to get like an chair. alien head, man. I, got, I hate this big crown that comes out the back. I have a fucking huge cranium anyway, man. Look at the size of this head. But Don't you worry do, about it, that. It blends so seamlessly. <laughs> you just have such a perfect hair now. Because like, the other thing then as well is that I don't feel like the fades are a professional cut. And so I want to find my professional cut yeah and I, I don't know you. what that is mm. now the girlfriend won't let me shave the hair because yeah. well this is well take what so the way this is she wanted to get dreads I hate dreads I'm sorry okay. like, she can yeah. do whatever she wants with her hair go pink green I don't care yeah I don't like dreads I, I just don't yeah and so when I was like I think I might shave the head she goes if you shave the head I'm getting dreads oh I was like, oh <laughs> <laughs> damn yeah Mm. So I don't know, but I, I I've always played around with shaving. No, yeah, you got some options, like mm. most certainly. It's a good bit um, of length in there as well, like. Like even even back. there is a good, bit, good nice bit of length there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I'd have to get you in the chair. Yeah. I'm saying go yeah. through a full consultation with you. Yeah. Um. When when all this is done. Right? When all of this is when done. When all this is done. Absolutely. Stephen, thank you so much, man, for coming on. It's been an excellent podcast, man. It's been pleasure, a pleasure buddy. talking to you. Like. Yeah. No problem. I at wish all. you all the best now with the rest of the COVID and that that. The routines you've built over the lockdown stand here. They will. I think they will. Yeah. I wish Absolutely. you all the best. Thank brother. you so Thank much. You so much coming up. Appreciate it.